You're listening to Boomers Today with your host, Frank Sampson. Well, welcome to Boomers Today. I'm your host, Frank Sampson. Of course, each week we bring you important and useful information on issues facing baby boomers, their parents, and other loved ones, of course. So we have, uh, of course, another great show uh, today. I did uh, want to take a moment to just thank everybody for all their support. Uh, we've certainly, uh, our podcast list has grown, uh, and it's grown because so many of you have connected through either Apple Podcasts, uh, on our on our free app on iHeartRadio or iHeart the iHeartRadio podcast and of course uh, we're pretty excited that we're now syndicated at many radio stations you could be listening to us on your own local radio station in your community so thank you so much for all your support and um, you know we're getting uh, uh, so many more listeners because of our great guests and we have another great guest and a very important subject matter today. Uh, we have with us Cynthia Perthews, who leads and owns the Senior Care Authority offices in New York City and Southwest Florida. Cynthia has a passion for helping others and advocating for those that do not have the ability for, to speak for themselves. Her own personal experience with her parents and her entrepreneurial background has helped so many families with the stress of helping and caring for aging loved ones. Cynthia is someone that I've known for quite some time now, and I'm just thrilled to have her on Boomers today. Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Frank, for having me today. Yeah, it's. You know, uh, I also, yeah, yeah, you know, ahead. I, I want to tell you, I, I want to tell you that, um, you know, I'm very pleased to be a part of the Senior Care Authority franchise, and, and like you said, we help older adults and their families to make life and living choices by finding the right assisted living or community, or helping them find teams to support living in the home. All right. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's wonderful. So. You know, t- tell us more. I mean, we're going to get on the subject of isolation, which is just such an, uh, an important subject matter uh, uh, regarding older adults. But kind of day to day, you kind of uh, briefly mentioned it. But tell us a little bit more about Senior Care Authority and kind of what you do and areas that you, you cover. T- tell us a little bit more. Sure. We work with families, and, and I like to say we, we cover them up with our our caring and our love, and we become a part of their family to help them make some really hard decisions and help in that transition, um, as well as help support the families. And we're there from the beginning, um, I say soup to nuts, we're there helping them find a place or make some decisions. We help them work with those communities or, or work with teams in their homes, and then we help them in the transition on the other side of it. And it brings us a lot of joy to our heart, as well as um, we, we make a living. Yeah, that's it's, it's it's wonderful work, and I know firsthand you do uh, uh, great work for the families you work with. So thank you for for what you do. Um, I I know that uh, we're going to be talking the rest of the time about a, an important subject matter that's isolation, but maybe before we uh, get into it, because everybody could maybe look at the term isolation differently. Why don't you explain what isolation is and how you're going to be referring to it uh, through the course of our discussion today? Sure. So when we talk about isolation, I want to make sure that we think about that that this recording is done in March of 2020 or April of 2020, I guess. And, And we all know where we are in April of 2020. So in talking about isolation, this is important for this pandemic, but it's also pertinent every day with the elderly before the pandemic and after the pandemic. So, you know, isolation really has many facets, but it's, it's mainly about the size of your social network and the ways and the amount of time that you interact with that network. And what's really important for me to point out here, and I'll point it out later, is that caregivers can have the exact same symptoms as a patient because it's easy to lose touch with your social network, whether you're caregiving, um, or whether you're someone who needs to be taken care of. So people sheltering in place, you know, they're both young and old, sick and well, Um, they're strong, or they may be cognitively challenged. And these challenges around 
social isolation and loneliness, they're going to continue after the pandemic is abated. So two-part question, all right? And uh, there, it's a big question, all right? Uh, may, you know, first part is maybe, talk, let's talk maybe about the physical impacts uh, that isolation has on older adults and the mental impacts uh, that it has on older adults. I know that's a, that's a lot to ask, but maybe you could... Uh, help our our listeners understand a little more? Sure. So I think first and foremost, we want to think about loneliness and isolation is loneliness, can be loneliness. It's not just a feeling. So, you know, like when you're hungry, hunger says go find some food. And when you're thirsty, thirst says go find some water. Well, when you're lonely and isolated, it says go find human connection. And these connections are essential for our survival. So on the physical side, science, has proven that isolation increases the vulnerability to disease. We see this in high blood pressure, um, higher heart rates, stress hormones, inflammation, and it's among people who might otherwise not get sick, but it can make them not only sick, but sicker. And, you know, there's a popular report, I'm sure you've seen it and maybe talked to some of your other guests about it, that was came out in 2015 from a neuroscientist and a psychologist at Brigham Young University. I think her name was Julianne Holt Lundstedt. Mm-hmm, right. And she looked at about, she looked at about three and a half million people. And it showed, her report showed that social isolation led to an increased rate of mortality in 29% of those subjects. And living alone increased mortality by 32%. And it didn't matter how old the subject was or what their gender, their location, or their culture. And then there were some other studies that show that prolonged social isolation is as detrimental to your health as smoking, I mean, get this, 15 cigarettes a day. And it can prompt cardiovascular disease and stroke and obesity. And then, you know, we'll talk about it in a moment, dementia. Right, right. that's, That's the physical side of it. Yeah. So maybe before you even get into the mental side of it. So, you know, there's all sorts, there's been all sorts of studies done, which I don't quite understand why money is spent on these studies, because they already know the answer. And and the question is, where, you know, they're asked somebody uh, that's a little older saying, where do you want to, where do you want to spend the rest of your life? And every one of them says home. I'm surprised that they come in at 90 some odd percent. Why isn't it 100 percent? Everybody wants to spend their life at home. But, you know, it's not necessarily uh, always the safest place to be at home, is it? No, it's not always the safest place. And, you know, I I do see those studies that say 90 percent. But there's also some studies that that I like to look at because you're talking to me again, a baby boomer. And it says that maybe 90 percent say they want to. But 60% of the baby boomers know they won't be aging at home. So maybe they think they want to do that. But if they know they're not, then they need to be thinking about that from a planning standpoint. I also believe that home has a variety of definitions. And home might not be, in in the truest sense of the word, the place that you've lived for 60 years, that number one is not a, you know, not, uh, ready to take you and help you along because there's not any any adaptability to it and it's lonely and it's dangerous. But home could also mean community. So maybe aging at home also means just being around your community. And there's so many other options that are around your community that can be counted as home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we were talking about, you discussed the physical impacts of isolation. Talk to us a little bit more about the mental impacts. Sure. On the mental side of it, once again, we're going to go to science, and it's proven that anxiety from isolation can really mess up your brain's wiring. And once again, there's a, a study, another study, a uh, recent study, this was from 2018, from the Florida State University College of Medicine, that showed that isolation can cause a 40% increase in the risk of dementia. And you know, that, that, that we don't want to have dementia. And again, remember, this is about caregivers as well. If caregivers are isolated, they have an increase of heart attacks and obesity and dementia. And so there's that mental impact. But I think there's a mental impact, again, on our communities, because if individuals are isolated um, and, and they're an elderly 
they're an elderly population who has so much still to give. We, as the community around them, we lose their contribution. So there's a mental aspect on what happens to people who aren't isolated. We're losing that elderly person's gifts. Right, right. So, you know, you know we're going through or have gone through, uh, you know, where people are forced to be isolated. Uh, and that's, uh, we could, you know, certainly talk about that. Um, but then there are situations where, let's say, a loved one, uh, maybe their adult children don't live uh, nearby them uh, and they're living alone and basically they're in front of the TV all day long and, and, and kind of, in a sense, self-isolate themselves. What, what suggestions do you have uh, in the latter example of uh, to families who have that, you know, are in that situation with a loved one to try to uh, uh, make it so they're not so isolated because you know the negative impacts that could that could occur. Well, there's a couple of ways to look at it. One is to maybe bridge the gap of what's best for the family and what's going on today. So, and not just by today, I don't mean the pandemic today, I mean just today in general. So today you have people who live far apart from each other. The, the parent says, I want to stay at home. The kids are busy, they can't get away, and they just need to bridge that gap until they can get there to really figure out what's best for the family. And there's a, there's a number, uh, you know, a plethora of things that can bridge the gap and that we can also do now in a pandemic. But none of these things are long term and they all have some diminishing returns. But let's just talk about some simple things. Um, I just read a report yesterday that talked about the way flowers raise your immunity. So you know what? You can plant some flowers or get some flowers planted. You can buy some flowers if you get to the grocery store, or you can have a, del a florist deliver flowers. Um, I, I know what flowers does for, do for me when I get flowers from someplace, and I know what flowers do for my clients when I've brought flowers to them to visit them in their home or visit them in the hospital. And it just lights up people's faces. So that's such a simple thing. Send some flowers. Right, um, right. You know, some of the other things that we all talk about probably um, too much and that everybody knows about is get get everybody on digital platforms. So we we know there's Zoom and Skype and FaceTime and all these different things. And that's a good short term, but that's not a long term where we want people who are isolated in their homes to just be dependent upon technology. First off, some of them have to learn technology. So that may mean you have to get somebody there to help them. Right. Um, so, so we can talk about that all day, but it, it's not a long-term solution. Yeah. Um, something that's really important though, along that digital is exercise and exercising from home just got a whole lot easier around here in the past few weeks because the gyms were forced to close and they're offering low and no cost alternatives all over, whether it's chair yoga or, um, sitting in a chair yoga or standing behind a chair yoga or, Laying on a couch yoga, there's all sorts of things that you could do to keep exercising. Yeah, there's, uh, there is so much. So you had mentioned the pandemic, and obviously that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, on people's mind. You know, it's uh, more, more reality now. Reality has set in that the pandemic can, can happen. Uh, so is it, uh, let's talk about the pandemic versus you know, everyday life as we're used to, uh, and, you know, the, the importance of isolation relative to both. And do you treat them both the same? Is it, is it different? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Well, um, I'm going to tell you twofold. I think it's the same, but I think it's different. So mm -hmm. I think what, what, what I know I, as an individual, I'm seeing the true, what it's really like to be isolated. Um, while I may have worked at home most of my career, that didn't mean I stayed at home most of my career. But the elderly sometimes don't have a choice about staying in, about being inside their homes or getting out. So I think that a lot of families are actually beginning to viscerally understand what their loved one goes through every day. Um, I saw some little joke the other day that had all the beginning words of the 
of the days of the week crossed out and said, basically, we have seven days. There are no more Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Right, right. It's day. And I feel that way sometimes. I, I, um, I'm not sure what day it is. I have to look at my computer to tell me what day it is. I truly believe that my elderly clients have that every day when they're isolated because they don't have any reason to differentiate between the days. So to me, it's the same. Mm -hmm. On the differentiating side, um, there's a lot more anxiety during what's going on in our world today that just exacerbates and overlays these items that are happening to our our older members of our family they were already isolated and now they're confused and they're they're um, they're afraid and they're anxious so it just i have to believe i haven't seen any reports i have to believe it almost doubles up what they were feeling beforehand so what what's your feeling on what's going to happen i mean what it, it, people are isolated for a certain period of time uh, are they just going to go back to normal are they going to consider families going to consider other options because of what they have been going through with a loved one uh, being isolated uh, what any, any thoughts there on either what's going to be done now or what's going to happen after uh, things get to some sort of normalcy let's say well, one of the one of the things that I think I sent in your direction was, you know, what can we do after life gets back to normal? I don't know that we know what normal is. I think that our normal, it's going to be a new normal because I believe that this has changed everything. However, I also believe that it is calling to attention what's been going on in these lonely and isolated homes of our loved ones that were kind of out of sight, out of mind for this global world we live in where children and, and close family members may live 5,000 miles away and they're going to see that. And there's a, there's so many new communities that are being built, um, were being built are still being built for this population. And I just think that people are going to see how beautiful and wonderful it is to not be isolated. Why should their loved one be isolated? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you kind of, said exactly what I was thinking. I I, I think maybe a, an older adult who's been able to have some freedom now doesn't have that freedom. They're kind of locked, you know, locked up. They've kind of experienced it and they go, you know, maybe I should consider being in a community with other like-minded people, maybe people my age that I could uh, talk with, be with, socialize with, etc. Do you think that's going to happen, or do you do you feel that the the adult children or other family members are going to want that to happen? Are going to have you're going to do you have strategies for them on how to uh, get their parent or other loved one to agree to maybe make a move since it would be better for them? I know it's a pretty uh, uh, open question there but uh, any thoughts sure well i think it's a it's a very broad question and i will um uh, not to be selfish about your podcast but i would say that that's a whole topic for another podcast and right. and there's some work i do around that called finding the right words and i'd love to come back and talk with you about that That'd be great. um you know one of the things that that i when i'm working with families and I would say 50% of the time when we talk, when I talk with them about social isolation, I don't think they really get what it is. And I think after this episode we're in now, they will get it because they've lived it. But they will tell me, oh, my dad's never been social. He's never been social. And what they mean is their dad isn't the kind of person who wants to go in and play, play cards and doesn't want to go in and have a book discussion or play Scrabble. But I would posit that social isolation and being social, if you will, is not about playing games and leading a discussion on a recent trip to Europe, that being social may just be sitting down in the lobby, reading the newspaper and watching all the activity that's flurrying around right, you. Right, right. Exactly. And that, that's where, you know, it, that, that's a piece that um, that's what I miss in my in my social isolation. I, I live alone and I have all of the computer pieces and technology, and I could go to an exercise class every hour, and I have 
a lot of people who call me and FaceTime and we discuss things. But there's something about just sitting at a restaurant and watching the activity around you that increases um, your ability to, to fight off inflammation and to keep your brain active. Yeah, I mean, like, bo- you know, both of us, between us, we have visited uh, many senior living uh, communities, and, you know, I have visited many uh, smaller residential care homes, literally probably in the thousands now. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen uh, older adults, you know, maybe just sitting on the porch or in the lobby, or and they're not participating necessarily in any activity, they're just observing. That's an that's an activity mm-hmm. for them, and they're pretty happy mm-hmm. doing that. You know, mm-hmm. vers- versus sitting alone. Um, you know, and that's that that can be certainly dangerous. Uh, you know, and I'm sure I know I have uh, had people on the show, uh, and I'm sure you have statistics that you know, or you may you may have them, but I know they're out there that. Uh, you know, suicide rate is up amongst older adults. Uh, you know, certainly depression is up amongst older adults. And I think so much of it relates to isolation. And um, I do, I yeah, do. And yeah. again, while I'm, I'm in the baby boomer age, um, because I'm stuck in my home, you know, it's, it's my, my day surrounds itself around what's my next meal. And when do I get to go to bed? And I know that my adult children would, um, they bear with me to let me do a FaceTime occasionally, but they don't want to FaceTime with me all day, every day. And I have to find ways to keep myself interested. And there's only um, so much bad TV that I can watch at night. So, you know, again, it's, it's not just about what's going on with the older adults. It's what goes on with us as well. Now, I think we're, feeling what they were feeling yeah so uh what what, i know we talked about it but uh a a little bit but uh what suggestions and i know you said it's kind of a a a separate topic and i agree but uh knowing uh should should a family member start having conversations with uh an older adult, loved one, a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, whatever, to start thinking about life, uh, the, the ne- next stage, kind the of getting stage. away. Uh, start, you know, start thinking about what, where do they start? I, I again, I know that's a whole session and a whole podcast we could do together, which we will. I want to do that, but any any sure. just advice that you can give to families on how to even begin that conversation and when would be the time to do it? Sure. You know, the way I look at this whole, at this whole business that, that, that we are in and and this whole um, step-by-step of moving someone is that I look at it and I, I try to explain to my clients, it's like that old um, statement of, do you know how to eat an elephant? (laughs) And the answer to that is one bite at a time. And so what we like to do um, with my team is we like to help our clients understand that there's three buckets to this process. And those buckets are where, um, when, and how. So don't get all caught up in my mom has a big house and she's got a lot of stuff and she said she won't go and I don't know if there's the money. You want to start with the little baby steps and the little one bite at a time and the bucket of where. Let's just go figure out where. And we don't have to even take mom with us. Let's do some research and let's get an expert to help us figure out the where. And know that, just like you said, it's not about a conversation. It's about conversations. So it's about, you know, if you think about it with, if you, with your kids, it's teachable moments. It's having tiny little bite-sized conversations about what are going to be the next steps. Um, because there's such a danger that people who have been isolated may remain isolated after all this grist passes. And it's time to reevaluate what's best for, what's best for our lives in general, what's best for our world we live in and what's best for our families and begin to have maybe more, um, broad umbrella discussions. Right. Right. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, we didn't even discuss this, and I think it's important. 
that still there is this perception that if someone doesn't live at home, they're going to be going into this, quote, old folks home. Can, can mm-hmm. you just, just take a, a, a moment or two? Because, you know, I could talk to you all day, but we only have a few minutes. But maybe just talk about this, the options that are out there for people. You know, not you know sure. versus you know, and a lot of people might not even realize that we we take it for granted because we're in the industry and we know all those wonderful options. Maybe you could give an overview of that. Sure. So you know, the thing that I also like to make sure people understand is that this is not what I would phrase. I always use this phrase: it's not your grandmother's nursing home. This right. is not where people live now. They're living in places with their peers where they can commiserate and they can celebrate things that happen in their age group. They all, you know, they can show pictures of their grandkids. They can talk about the jobs that they did. There are people that are in assisted living communities that get out and go to work every day. They may go to work volunteering at the hospital. They may go to work as a paralegal in a legal office. They may go to work reading to kids in a school, but they walk out the door every day and live the same life that they were living in their home. But Someone made their breakfast. Someone's making up their bed and cleaning their their apartment while they're gone. And if on the days they don't work, there's some activities planned for them. And they just don't have to worry about anything. And that's what what community living is these days. Now, there's that's assisted living. There's also memory care where your loved one is safe. You don't have to worry about getting the phone call in the middle of the night that they're going to the grocery store with their pajamas on and barefooted. Um and there's activities that keep them engaged and really are reaching into their reality of where they are at that point. And that's the beauty of these communities. And the beauty of these communities is also is to figure out when, and that when is not when it's a crisis. Um, you want to figure out when before there's a crisis so that they can, these, that, that their, your parents can go and, and develop a social network in their new place. And I will tell you, nine out of 10 of my clients, when they go into a community, they find out there's a lot of people there that they already know. They didn't realize that that's where they were living. And so they can pick up their life and just start it again someplace where they're safe and warm and healthy and fed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. I appreciate it. So Mm -hmm. unfortunately, Mm -hmm. we're kind of out of time, but why don't you uh, share with everybody how they can get a hold of you and your website, anything you'd like to share with our listeners? Sure, sure. Thanks again, Frank, for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And just as a reminder, I have, in my opinion, the best two territories in the entire world, and that's New York City and Southwest Florida. So um, I, I work with a lot of snowbirds between there, and I have a team in both of those places. But just as a reminder, you can find this podcast on a variety of places that Frank talked about in the beginning, but you'll also be able to find it on my website. And that website is www dot s-c-a-n-y-f-l dot com so that's s-c-a like senior care authority n-y like new york and f-l like florida and there's a resource tab there and it has other podcasts and blogs and books and webinars and a variety of things that'll help make your journey easier and if they want to talk to you but maybe they need help in another part of the country you could certainly uh, Mm -hmm. refer them to the right I can right refer people. them and I can yeah. help them. Great. And they can also, you know, they can send me an email. It's Cynthia at SeniorCareAuthority.com. Perfect. Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us on uh, Boomers today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank mm-hmm. everybody out there for joining us. Please, please be safe. And we'll talk to everybody real soon. You've been listening to Boomers Today with Frank Sampson. To learn more about today's show, visit BoomersTodayRadio.com and join us next time for another edition of Boomers Today.